you. Please stand by. You will now be placed into conference. Hello, Linda. I am the Family Leadership Institute Director and Training Coordinator for the Maryland Coalition of Families, and this is um, one of our projects, which is our High Noon Web Cafe, um, which we hold regularly, sometimes uh, twice a month, sometimes once a month, um, and uh, we um, present issues and um, items of interest to families um, and providers and uh, youth, young adults, um, and the people who work with them. Uh, and we partner with uh, Innovations Institute at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, Department of Psychiatry, Child Psychiatry. Um, so today we have a presentation on um, ADHD, and we were fortunate to have um, two child psychiatry fellows um, who are going to uh, speak with you today. Uh, this will be recorded, uh, so uh, and we will send out the link uh, for, for the recording, so you'll be able to hear uh, and see it again. Um, and uh, during the session, you can chat um, on, in the chat box, send questions that way. If you don't want to verbally ask questions, um, you can send them that way as well. So um, I will introduce our two speakers. Uh, first speaker is Dr. Gohar Ch Chahari, um, who is a native of Lahore, Pakistan, and currently lives in Chantilly, Virginia, with her husband and her son, Aiden. She works as a child and adolescent psychiatry fellow in Baltimore, Maryland. She graduated from Fatima, and please excuse me, uh, Jean Ha Medical College with a medical doctorate. She completed adult psychiatry residency training at Nassau University Medical Center in New York and is currently completing her child and adolescent psychiatry fellowship at the University of Maryland, Shepherd Pratt. Dr. Chahari has special interests in working with children and adults who have experienced trauma, advocacy for children and families, and issues pertaining to cultural competency in psychiatry. And our second presenter uh, speaker is Dr. Maria Trent Watson, who is a native of Greenville, North Carolina, and currently lives and works in Baltimore, Maryland, as a child and adolescent psychiatry fellow. Dr. Trent Watson graduated from Yale University with a Bachelor of Science in Psychology. She obtained her medical doctorate at the University of North Carolina School of Medicine. She completed her adult psychiatry residency training at the University of Maryland Shepherd Pratt Program and she is currently completing a fellowship in child and adolescent psychiatry, also at the University of Maryland Shepherd Pratt. Dr. Trent Watson is passionate about raising awareness of mental illness in minority communities and loves the resilience of children. She has special interest in school-based consultation, cultural competency, and plans to pursue a private practice. She is also a proud wife and mother to Dr. Christopher Watson and Christopher Watson III, respectively. So welcome, doctors. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for um, calling in and logging in and joining us for our presentation on attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Um, again, what we're going to do is aim to give you an overview um, of this disorder, and really our objectives, as you can see, um, are to really define it, tell you a little bit about the epidemiology, possible causes, presentation and impact, um, specifically how to diagnose it, um, any co-occurring disorders that may um, exist, as well as treatment and prognosis. Um, and lastly, we'll also provide some um, online references for parental support. So first of all, we'll talk about uh, ADHD, how it's defined, what it is. ADHD stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, and it's a disorder that manifests in early childhood with symptoms of hyperactivity, impulsivity, and or inattention, just like the name suggests. Um, these symptoms affect all aspects of life in these children, whether it's cognitive, academic, behavioral, emotional, social functions. There are three main types of ADHD, the inattentive type, the hyperactive impulsive type, and the combined type. Um, 
Um, so just a little bit about the epidemiology. Um, it is really a disorder that's fairly prevalent. Um, studies pretty much have shown that it's present in 8 to 10 percent of school-age children and that predominantly it affects our boys. Um, so specifically the types that are affecting um, children, um, the hyperactive type really occurs at a ratio of 4 to 1, boys to girls, and the predominantly inattentive type um, occurs in a ratio of about 2 to 1. Um, just a little bit about the possible causes or etiology of ADHD. Unfortunately, the exact cause is unknown. However, there have been studies that have some contributory factors. One of them, we do know from twin studies that genetic control and neurotransmitters in the brain, um, namely dopamine and norepinephrine, and an issue with their metabolism in the cerebral cortex or the brain. Um, there have been studies to suggest that um, exposure to tobacco and possibly alcohol during pregnancy has led to ADHD in such children. Um, the cause of dietary factors is still controversial. However, we have seen in some minor studies that food additives, refined sugar intake, food sensitivities, um, essential fatty acid deficiencies, and mineral deficiencies have been shown to have some effect on um, the concurrence of ADHD. Other factors have been lead exposure, head trauma, low birth weight, and prematurity. Okay, so also just to illustrate that there um, is a biological basis um, in ADHD, um, studies have shown that there are truly structural brain differences that occur in the brains of children with ADHD as compared to children without it. Um, they found that there is actually a reduced uh, volume of the frontal cortex, um, and again, that's the part of the brain that's really responsible for um, executive function. Um, there's also smaller cerebellar, as well as cerebral hemispheres um, and posterior and inferior cerebellar vermis. Um, and then also the smaller caudate volumes um, are occurring in those with ADHD as opposed to those not. But again, these do normalize um, during adolescence. Um, and these two other areas basically really affect um, response inhibition and basically can manifest as impulsivity. Now we'll talk a little bit about how children with ADHD can present, and we have two examples to sort of um, give you a nice picture of what the symptoms look like in real life. I'm sorry, just give us a second. We've learned that we're having a little bit of difficulty with the slides and also the volume. Um, just give us a few minutes, please. Okay. I, I just got indication that people are able to see the slides now. At least somebody, one person said. Okay. Is everyone with us? Can you see the slides? Can you hear us? Why don't we raise our hand if you can see the slides? Okay, great. It looks like everyone can see them. Okay. Thanks for your patience. So um, just a little bit about how the symptoms of ADHD actually show up in real life and what these kids can look like um, in the real world. So our first example is of Sean, the Energizer Buddy. So as the name suggests, he is always on the go. Just a little bit about what his history looks like from birth to, say, kindergarten. He was a full-term healthy baby was very active as a toddler. His mother um, described him as always on the go or driven by a motor. She, he seemed to have problems with daycare. He would be biting other children, climbing up on furniture, not sitting in a seat. In preschool, teachers would often complain that he needed 
frequent redirection, was aggressive towards other children or even adults, wandered around during circle time, again, not sitting in a seat. In kindergarten, now there were more concerns about learning, that he didn't sit still long enough to learn, he fought with other peers, ran out of the classroom. So you see he's just very much on the go. Okay, so this is another example of how ADHD might present. So we have Anna, the daydreamer. Um, again, she was born at full term, a healthy baby. Um, she appeared to be very quiet as a toddler and often was found playing by herself. Uh, when she reached school age, um, she often would forget to do her chores. Uh, she would misplace her schoolwork. Um, teachers would often complain of her gazing into space. Um, and again, these things really contributed to her grades suffering quite a bit. Um, they also noticed that it seemed as though she would not listen when spoken to and that she often needed frequent reminders to complete tasks. Um, again, and this is a child that really was not um, identified as a behavioral problem and so really was uh, manifesting more of an inattentive um, type of ADHD. And later on in school and as they grew into adolescence, um, teachers and parents may see problems with breaking down large tasks into smaller units. They may have trouble prioritizing, sequencing, and integrating information. They're often perceived as lazy or unmotivated because they underperform to potential. They may develop problems with oppositional behavior, and aggression is often a common complaint. So Dr. Chowdhury and I definitely have heard several parents complain of uh, the following. Um, so how exactly is it that my child can play video games for hours on end, but yet can't seem to get even 10 minutes of homework done? And that's a great question. Um, often video games have a lot of reinforcing factors. Um, you know, there's novelty, there's new levels they can achieve if they pass certain um, uh, challenges. There's a lot of structure, you know, you can, um, you have but so many chances to reach a goal. If not, then you know you have to try again and start from the beginning. Um, there's a lot of distractions, so light, sounds, um, new figures that pop up, um, and just in general, a lot of rewards and reinforcers. All of these things can really positively affect focus and concentration, and really make it seem as if the child really has no problem with these um, things, focus and concentration, when they're playing video games. However, the homework and other tasks that you know the child might need to complete don't really have these type of reinforcing factors, and so that's where we really start to see problems. So how do we diagnose ADHD? Um, the diagnosis is made clinically. Um, how we do it in the psychiatric setting is that information is gathered from teachers, parents, caregivers, um, any prior health care providers, and um, during the child interview, as well as the parent interview. And the child must meet criteria from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which is also called the DSM-4. So uh, the specific criteria um, for the diagnosis of ADHD according to the DSM-4, um, the child must have at least six uh, symptoms of inattention for six months um, and or at least six hyperactive symptoms for six months. Um, and then there must be evidence of impairment of function um, in more than one setting. So usually at school, the grades are suffering, um, they're not participating appropriately. And then at home, um, a lot of behavioral issues could be the way it manifests or even um, not following through on um, directions and instructions from the parents. Um, and usually we ask, you know, that the onset of symptoms occur by the age of seven. And usually um, symptoms do indeed manifest quite before that age. So, like we mentioned earlier, um, there are three types of ADHD, the hyperactive, um, the inattentive, and the combined type. Um, I'm just going to go down a list of hyperactive slash impulsive symptoms, and um, we usually look for to be able to actually diagnose a child with ADHD, we usually look for at least six hyperactive or impulsive symptoms that have lasted for six months or more. And those symptoms are a lot of fidgeting, uh, not being able to stay in seat, especially in school when they're expected to sit in their seat and do their work or listen to the teacher. Um, so children run or climb a lot and excessively all the time. 
Um, they often have difficulty playing quietly or, or even on their own. They're often described as being driven by a motor or always on the go. They talk a lot. They talk out of turn. They talk excessively. They may also blurt out answers and don't wait for their turn. And they may also interrupt or intrude on others when they're talking. So now the inattentive symptoms of ADHD to look for. Again, we um, try to identify at least six of these uh, for parents. <coughs> Um, we often will see that the children will display careless errors, often when doing their homework or when um, completing tasks, um, difficulty sustaining attention. Um, they'll appear very disorganized, not able to find things, not able to get things together. Um, they often lose things, um, very distractible. Uh, they can be forgetful. Um, they avoid uh, tasks that really involve sustained attention. Um, they often don't listen to direct instruction and don't even follow through on the instruction. Uh, so again, these are more inattentive type symptoms. And these typically tend to manifest a little bit later than the hyperactive symptoms. However, they can also um, occur earlier. And then we have the loss type or the combined type um, in which, as the name suggests, again, um, we should have at least six symptoms from both categories, um, namely the hyperactive impulsive category and the inattentive category. And the time span is, again, at least six months or more. And this is really the classic subtype of ADHD. Kids with ADHD combined type are usually the ones that are um, identified by teachers as well as parents the most. So apart from meeting criteria, um, to meet diagnosis for ADHD, um, it's also important to gather information from teachers, parents, and the child themselves. Um, also, to get that information, but also to rule out other um, potential problems or even um, normal developmental things. Um, so from teachers, we might ask, how does this child compare to same age peers? Um, we might also ask about the impact of the child's symptoms on their learning. Um, and we might ask them to complete some rating scales. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about this um, more later. Um, from parents, again, if there's been any family history of ADHD, um, as we mentioned earlier, there is a genetic component. Um, we want to ask parents also about the early developmental history. Again, really getting at was there any prenatal um, exposures, was there prematurity, low birth weight, et cetera. Um, and then ask the parents about observable behavioral problems. And we would also ask them to complete rating scales as well to help us in the diagnosis. Um, and then from the child, um, apart from getting the actual symptoms um, that characterize ADHD, we'd ask about internalizing symptoms. So really, you know, is there some moodiness? Is there problems with self-esteem? Are there other issues involved um, or other diagnoses even that could manifest in a way that looks like ADHD? Um, then also if there are any precipitating stressors um, that may preclude their behavioral problems, we'd want to find out about as well. Um, and again, rating scales can assist with diagnosis as well as treatment monitoring. Um, some common scales that we use are the Vanderbilt um, ADHD Diagnostic Scales, which again, we admit we give to the teachers and to the parents to fill out. Um, we usually ask that the teachers who fill out this scale um, has, has worked with the child for at least, I think it's four to six months um, continuously. And then the parent or the caregiver who has been consistently caring for the child. Um, also, this can be administered um, after treatment has begun um, to really monitor how well treatment is progressing, and we would expect that um, the total score would be lower. Um, also, there is the Connors um, scale as well, which is commonly used, um, and these are just examples of rating scales that can be used to assist with diagnosis as well as treatment monitoring. So, um, sometimes the picture presented by a child may be confusing and may not be typically that of ADHD. It may look like a hyperactive kid, but there may be other issues involved um, which may make the, the diagnosis of ADHD difficult or may preclude ADHD. Um, such cases may be in a developmentally normal high activity child, so it's just someone who genetically is just predisposed to be a lot more active than your average kid. However, they're not meeting criteria of the six symptoms of hyperactivity or the six symptoms of inattention as we described from the DSM-IV. Um, 
They may also have some developmental concerns. They may have language issues or problems with motor skills or even social and cognitive or learning disabilities. Um, we've seen kids with learning disabilities having trouble focusing because they're not understanding what's being taught in school. So they'll come off as either inattentive or they may just want to run around and avoid learning because it's so hard for them, so they may just be um, labeled as hyperactive. Um, then there are situational factors um, such as violence exposure, school issues, or other stresses that may make a child appear to have ADHD, but then again, um, once those situational factors are removed or dealt with um, in, in the office or during therapy, they may have um, an amelioration of symptoms. Then there are biological factors. They may have a physical illness, or they may be in effect of a medication, or they may be using illicit drugs. But then again, that's um, for older children, teenagers, or adolescents that we can look at, um, at the substance abuse issue. Um, or they may have other psychiatric disorders, such as other disruptive behavior disorders, like oppositional defiant disorder or conduct disorder, or they may have issues with anxiety, mood, or even PTSD, which may manifest as ADHD symptoms. Okay, so again, it is important to tease out other factors that could um, make it look as if a child has ADHD, but also important to recognize that children with ADHD do often have co-occurring disorders as well. Um, so common, uh, along with ADHD, are disruptive behavior disorders, such as oppositional defiant disorder, um, and also even conduct disorder. Um, and that really has more to do with a child um, opposing all authority, uh, frequently lying, uh, frequently annoying people on purpose, um, and even into the conduct spectrum, more so um, purposely breaking the law, um, really disregard for any authority whatsoever, um, and, and real malintent um, to hurt people. Um, anxiety disorders are also pretty common um, in terms of co-occurring with ADHD. Um, and again, a child might be you know, really fidgety as well, really worried, really scared, really um, apprehensive about certain situations, um, environments, or even um, factors in their life that might have caused some anxiety. Um, mood disorders are also common. Um, again, we could see depression. We might see a, a bit of bipolar. Um, those are things to look for. Um, as well as Dr. Chowdhury mentioned, learning disorders, reading, math, written expression, those are things to look for as well, um, as well as substance abuse. Oh, and one more important thing to add about substance abuse, um, usually ADHD, when it's untreated, um, really puts the child at risk for um, greater um, greater self-medication, and often, you know, they'll be more likely to use um, illicit substances or even alcohol um, to try to medicate themselves. So it really is important that children are treated um, that have been identified to have ADHD to um, prevent them from using substances down the line. Now we can come to um, treatment. Um, the treatment for ADHD is multimodal. Um, we like to educate the child, parents, caregivers, and even teachers about the diagnosis of ADHD, what it entails, uh, what it means for them, and um, how they can make the environment for the child um, comfortable enough to be able to um, function normally. Um, other treatment modalities are, of course, medications, behavioral interventions, educational interventions, and then alternative therapies, and we'll go through each of these individually. Okay, so psychoeducation. Um, this is definitely important um, to educate the family, the caregivers, teachers, um, as well as the patient, and pretty much anyone that's involved in the care um, or even interacts with the patient about ADHD. Um, this in itself can be very therapeutic. The child and the family and the others involved really have a better understanding of why the child is acting the way they do and can start to make either accommodations or have more understanding of what's going on. Um, and just in general, you know, it kind of helps to um, get rid of the a preconceived notion that, you know, this is just a bad kid, or maybe the parenting really wasn't good, or maybe the schooling, um, you know, is not appropriate for the child. Um, it really helps to dispel those myths. Um, 
Um, so a little bit about medication. Um, stimulants are the first line of treatment for ADHD. And there are two main categories of stimulants, the amphetamines and the methylphenidates. The amphetamines, some examples of those are Adderall, Dexedrine, Vyvanse, their um, advertisements on TV, in the ra on the radio, in newspapers for them. So you may have heard these names. Um, and then again, methylphenidate examples are Ritalin, Concerta, Daytrona. Um, so a little bit about the multimodal treatment study of children that combine type of ADHD or the MTA study. This study um, was crucial when it came to understanding what's the best treatment for children with ADHD. About 600 children were randomly assigned to four treatment groups in this study. Uh, the two, four groups were those who got stimulants only, those who received stimulants and behavioral therapy, those who received behavioral therapy only, or standard community care. And the standard community care was really just an initial assessment of the child and uh, sent out with the diagnosis of ADHD, where they were sent back to their primary care providers and they were given a list of mental health resources. And it was seen as a result of the study that medications were really um, the best treatment for children with ADHD. And it was seen that medications alone had the same improvement in symptoms um, along with um, medications and behavioral therapy. However, it was seen that behavioral therapy alone and community care alone didn't really ameliorate the core symptoms of ADHD, which were inattention, hyperactivity, and um, impulsivity. Okay, so medications continued. Um, often parents will be concerned that, you know, stimulants, isn't that uh, something that the kid may become addicted to? Um, while, yes, there's a very slight chance that that could be a possibility, um, we definitely recommend that the child is getting this medication, you know, prescribed from either their primary care physician or psychiatrist who's going to be closely monitoring um, them, usually on a monthly basis, and even more frequently at the beginning of treatment to make sure that uh, we have the correct dose. Uh, usually we do start low and go slow, that's the catchphrase, um, and really only titrate the medicine up to uh, what's needed to um, treat the symptoms appropriately. However, for parents that, um, you know, really are more so concerned, again, about that um, risk of possible dependence or addiction, um, there are all alternatives to stimulants. Um, and these include uh, selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, Stratera. Um, that's one that's been commonly used. Um, however, um, not usually as effective as the uh, stimulant medications. Also, there are alpha agonists, including clonidine and Penex. Um, now, these medications um, more so um, have been used as blood pressure medications to lower blood pressure. Um, however, we have found that they can assist in treating the hyperactivity um, and impulsivity that goes along with ADHD. Um, but again, um, the first line of treatment and the medications that studies truly show to be um, most effective are the stimulants. Um, in general, with any medication that's going to be used, it's um, necessary to have appropriate monitoring. Um, and specifically with the stimulants, uh, we do want to watch for um, the height and weight on a regular basis and the pulse and blood pressure as these can be um, affected um, negatively by stimulants. And just to get specific, um, stimulants can um, cause a bit of a uh, slowing of the growth, uh, a growth, sorry. Um, so we do measure height and weight um, on a periodic basis. Um, and then pulse and blood pressure stimulants can cause an increase in heart rate, cause a tachycardia, um, and it can also cause some hypertension. So again, we'll want to monitor these closely as the child is being titrated and maintained on their medicine. Um, last but not least, um, we do also make sure that the child doesn't have any significant history of arrhythmias or heart problems um, for which we might need to obtain an EKG first before starting a single medication. Um, then we come to behavioral interventions as another modality of treatment. Um, the goal of behavioral intervention is to change behaviors of the child. Um, and it's usually in the form of parent and child behavior therapy. Uh, what we'd like to have 
parents do is give a lot of structure to the child because they've seen that um, children in general and ADHD children in particular really um, respond to structure in their lives. So just maintaining a daily schedule, minimizing distractions, especially during their classwork or homework, um, specific places for them to do their tasks. Again, this is more school-based, like their um, academic work. Um, just giving them small but reachable goals so that they have a sense of pride and a sense of success so that they don't feel like they're failing. Um, rewarding positive behavior, which is really important and which is sort of a positive reinforcement. Um, it's also good to ask parents to use charts or checklists to help the kids stay on task. So they could have a checklist for chores that they have to do for that day or for that week, and um, they can be in control of that. Um, another good thing for children with ADHD is to limit their choices so they can feel like they're in control, but then they don't feel scattered because they've been given a large number of choices, whether it's uh, what they want for dinner to what they want for Christmas. So it can be really anything. Um, finding activities the child can be successful at. Again, this is um, this goes with the whole idea of positive reinforcement and giving them small but reachable goals, and also using calm discipline. Um, it's, uh, behavior interventions have shown to improve behavior problems, but then again, they do not significantly reduce, as I mentioned earlier, the core symptoms of ADHD, which are inattention, impulsivity, and hyperactivity. Okay, and then there are also educational interventions that can be put into place. Um, ADHD does qualify as a disability under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, and this may um, allow the child to qualify for special education or accommodations under Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. Um, so what we're really hoping for is that changes in the educational environment will really help to optimize learning and achievement for the children. Um, so these might include tutoring, um, use of a resource room, um, in-class modifications such as sitting near the front so that the child will remain focused and free from distractions and can really hear um, the teacher. Also having assignments written on the board, again, to help the kid focus and remember um, on what the specified assignments are or what uh, textbooks or chapters they need to be reading from, um, or even having extended time for tests, again, for a child that might um, have problems really focusing in and sustaining their attention. If they get distracted, they'll have a little extra time to really um, revisit the questions that are being asked of them and have enough time to answer. And these are just examples. Um, there can also be pullouts from the class, whether um, the child, for the majority of the day, um, you know, is educated with their peers, but then is pulled out for certain subjects that they're having difficulty with or certain times of the day when they're having difficulties. Um, or they can even just be um, separated out completely and have um, a smaller classroom setting um, with a smaller teacher-to-student ratio um, where they can learn more effectively in that way. Now, there are some alternative treatments which have been shown to be effective in um, smaller studies. However, they're often not appropriately studied, we've seen. Um, some have average outcomes, some have poor outcomes, uh, and they're not FDA approved. Um, some of these are vision training, um, elimination diets, uh, which have shown to um, which have been shown to show some improvement in um, children with ADHD. They've seen that once um, they have eliminated sugars, allergens, or additives from their diets, uh, the symptoms have improved, and this has been further proven by actually reintroducing the um, substances or the uh, parts of the diet that were eliminated, and the symptoms actually reappeared. So this is one of those um, alternative treatments, which does, uh, does seem to have um, some improvement in symptoms in some children with ADHD. Um, other treatments are megavitamins, herbal and mineral supplements, um, EEG biofeedback, yoga and massage. Okay, and so a little bit about prognosis of ADHD. Um, so again, this is really a disorder that manifests in early childhood, 
But 50% of children that are diagnosed with it do go on to um, have persistent symptoms into adulthood. And mainly the symptoms that you'll see persist are those of inattention and those of impulsivity. Um, often the hyperactivity uh, will improve as um, adults or as the children grow up. Um, and a lot of times, even with the inattentive and impulsivity, um, by the time the child has really um, you know, reached more maturity, they're able to put in place um, either effective coping skills or um, little tricks um, that they've learned to help deal with the symptoms that they have. Um, studies have also shown that in general there are impairments in the domains of education that persist, um, employment, uh, substance abuse, uh, like we talked about a little earlier, um, and injuries and driving accidents. However, um, the hope is really that um, these impairments can be decreased uh, with treatment of ADHD. And again, mainly um, with medication, behavioral therapy, uh, but also with other treatments that we've mentioned as well. Now we have um, just a list of resources that we would like parents listening and even parents who later come back to this um, webinar or the website to be able to um, reach out to. Uh, they're great resources, they're very family oriented, child driven, and um, they should be able to help out um, with, par with parents and children who have been diagnosed with ADHD. Um, one of them, which we often uh, mention, is the Children and Adults with Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or CHAD, which is, as you can see, www.chad.org. Another um, good resource is the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill, which is, again, very family-oriented and is mostly a resource for uh, family members of uh, people or even children with mental illness. Uh, that is NAMI.org. Um, another good resource is the Maryland Disability Law Center. They have been very helpful as a resource to parents whose children have been diagnosed with ADHD or other mental illnesses and who have wanted resources in the community, especially the school, So, th which would include um, getting an advocate for IEP uh, or even 504 plans or um, other educational accommodations in the school. And the last one is the National Center for Learning Disabilities, which has also been very helpful for children. Okay. Um, so, yeah, we definitely would like to acknowledge Dr. Gloria Reeves, um, who definitely assisted us in the development of this presentation. And here are a list of our references. Sorry, I think one at the top got a little um, got covered or whited out. Um, but we'd love to open the floor for questions at this time. Um, if you have a question, I guess the best way to do this is you can raise, oh, there we go, Chiquita. Um, oh, everybody's unmuted, so uh, Chiquita, you're number one, so go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. My question is, because I, I have a lot of concerns about this, because this is one of the diagnoses that my son has, and my question is, do you believe that... Um, more gym and more activities, um, whether it be in school or at home or in the neighborhood or so forth, will help lower some of the diagnoses for ADHD and um, concerns such as this. Okay. Um, definitely um, regular engagement in physical activity and having a physical outlet on a daily basis is important for the healthy development of any child. Um, I think definitely having that physical outlet can decrease some of the hyperactivity or um, difficulty with, um, you know, still remaining focused in school. But for those children that have hyperactivity to the extent that they're actually diagnosed with ADHD, I don't think that that alone will help to, you know, give them the best chance at uh, succeeding in school and learning and, and moving forward. Um, but I do think it can be helpful to see child. Did that answer your question? 
Well, sort of, yeah. I just was wondering, did you think it would help? Because it seems as though when we were in school, there was less diagnosis of it. And I do believe that environment plays a lot of role in it. But it seems to me that when you do more activities, and I know that food has a lot to do with it and a lot of other things play a role in it, but I just wonder if activities would help reduce some of the symptoms of it was my, basically my question. So um, it's definitely right. Um, children with ADHD or even children who are a little on the hyper side um, will ha will actually tire out. Right. Because they're in a lot of, um, because of all that physical activity, but then the question is, how much physical activity would be that threshold for that particular child? Mm -hmm. And again, um, I understand the question was, you know, would it decrease the symptoms? Unfortunately, no. Physical activity, gym, sports, yes, they will tire the child out so that they're tired and come home to sleep. But then again, how much physical activity? And really, that dealing with the problem as a whole. So mm. doing that would be great, but then there are other, the other treatments like the stimulants and the behavior therapy, those are things that would help some more. Thank you. Okay, Cindy? Yeah, hi. I touched in my questions, but um, I'm wondering what your input is on the medication intuitive. Intuiv, I don't know if you've heard of it. Yeah, definitely. So Intuiv is a long-acting form of Tenex, one of the medications that we mentioned previously. Um, that's one of the alpha agonists. And um, initially, um, FDA approved of um, hypertension. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely, we have used Intuiv um, for the treatment of ADHD in our patients. Um, is it our first line? No, it's not our first line treatment. But we have seen some improvement in symptoms of um, hyperactivity and impulsivity. Right. Um, again, um, the problem being my daughter abuses the stimulants and doesn't have the patience to wait for, um, we never even tried the Stratera, so it's in the the category of the alpha and Gnostics? Mm -hmm. Agonist, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And you've met with some success with it? Yes, we have. Yes, but it takes a while to kick in. Um, and sort of not so much, to be quite honest with you, Stratera, yes, because it's a selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. It can take anywhere from four, really, to even eight weeks to really, truly um, build up in the system and really show positive effects. Um, in terms of Intuitive, um, it should start working fairly soon. It's not going to be as immediate as it's like two weeks? Definitely by two weeks you should see improvement. Um, and it's not like the other amphetamines that, you know, on the weekend sometimes I wouldn't do that. It would be best to continue with the intuitive. Yes, continue with it and then talk with your um, prescriber about, you know, increasing the doses needed to um, treat the symptoms. Thank you. Uh -huh. and, and now we have, um, in my office, I, I have a uh, family member who is interested in asking several questions. So she's right here to ask her questions. Do particular drugs work best to help with impulsivity? My son's hyperactivity is well treated with um, um, a Ritalin drug, but he's still very impulsive. So um, sometimes we see parents or even, even um, us overlapping the symptoms of hyperactivity and impulsivity. So it's really interesting that you can delineate those two. Um, yes, if hyperactivity is being well treated by the methylphenidate or the stimulant that he's on, that's great. Um, a lot of times if there's um, remnants of impulsivity in children with ADHD, we see that behavioral therapy, uh, parent skills training really helps because, as well as individual therapy of the child, because um, the impulsivity comes more from thinking after acting or acting first and thinking later, and that has a lot to do with learning coping skills, learning to take a step back, and even just structure in their environment. So we believe that behavioral intervention can really help with that if he's still having trouble with impulsivity. Okay, thanks. Um, other question I have is, I know that in the short term, um, these drugs affect growth. Is there much research as to how 
uh, growth will be affected in the long term? Yeah, so the question was about um, it, were there any studies that show that growth will be affected in the long term. Um, to be quite honest with you, um, usually the studies really don't span much more than um, eight weeks to a little more than maybe 16 or 24 weeks. Um, any study that would go longer than that would be quite, ex like quite expensive. Um, and so, no, there really aren't very many studies now that will show the long-term effects of, of growth, um, you know, due to stimulant treatment. Um, but we do see that, you know, it, the growth can be stunted, which is why it's really important to continue to monitor it on, you know, monthly basis or even, you know, as the dose is um, normalized or, or maintained, then maybe every three or four months we'll check. And if we are noticing a significant, you know, decline in the growth curve or in weight, um, we can talk about either decreasing the stimulant um, or even switching to one of the alternative therapies. Um, but the important thing to really keep in mind, too, is the risk-benefit um, ratio, you know, um, is the improvement in the inattentiveness, is the improvement in the hyperactivity and impulsivity, uh, you know, does that outweigh, um, you know, the potential risks of being maybe slightly stunted in growth? Another, along the same lines, I have a friend who's now giving her daughter um, an appetite stimulant do you, to encourage growth. Do you recommend doing that? I'm sorry, what was this, the appetite stimulant? Uh, I have a friend who's giving her daughter an appetite stimulant to encourage growth. Her daughter is also have a, has ADHD, HD, and I haven't seen ADHD, and I haven't seen um, recommendations to do this, and I was just wondering, would you recommend that? Um, to be honest with you, I would defer to the pediatrician. Um, I mean, if the child does have um, a very low, you know, weight, for height, um, you know, and have, have a very low BMI, I would definitely first consult with a pediatrician to see if they would recommend an appetite stimulant. Um, but more than likely, significantly below um, the curve in both height and weight, that could, like growth hormone or some type of um, appetite, appetite stimulant might be recommended by the pediatrician. Um, but also you'd want to make sure that it wouldn't um, cause any cross-reactions with stimulant medication or any other medication they're taking. Okay, and I have one last question. You mentioned there's a difference in the brains of these kids that have ADHD. Um, I didn't completely understand. Do the, do the brain, does the brain structure, um, as they develop, become more similar to their peers as they approach adolescence, or is it still going to be quite different? Or do we know? So as far as we know, um, when as children grow into adolescence, the size of the caudate nucleus, which is one of the structures in the brain, which is smaller in ADHD children, can normalize um, as these children grow into adolescence and goes up to the size that a normal peer with, without ADHD would have. However, nothing really is known about um, the, the differences in the brain structure as these children grow older with the cerebellar. Um, volume, or even the brain volume itself as these children grow older. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm sorry, I, I see a question now that's been typed in in the chat. Just want to address that from Denise Turner. Um, the question is, how early of age can ADD be diagnosed? And we frequently have parents told he's just a boy. <laughs> um, so there really is no earliest age to be diagnosed. Um, according to the DSM-IV-TR, uh, we really expect to have some type of symptom manifestation before the age of seven. Um, now, what's important to keep in mind is normal development. Um, you know, toddlers, for instance, or babies in general, you know, they're not going to be as focused. They're going to be easily distracted. They're going to be kind of running and jumping and climbing on things and really um, exploring the use of their legs and, you know, all these new found abilities that they have. So uh, it really is important to keep in mind what is normal in terms of developmental um, progression and not be too quick to jump to the diagnosis of ADHD. Um, um, let me just see. I'm sorry. I'm trying to read the, the next question from Christy Hughes. Um, so many children each year that I teach are being diagnosed with ADHD. Is it that we are recognizing it more, or is it our environment societal habits? Um, it's a good question. Um, definitely we're recognizing it more. Um, you know, we have specific criteria that must be met to diagnose it. Um, parents have been educated about the illness. 
um, teachers, other caregivers, other uh, people that work with children have been educated about it. So people really do kind of have their radar um, on for it and are looking for it. Um, so yeah, I would definitely say that it has more so to do with us recognizing it, diagnosing it, and um, seeing benefits of treatment of ADHD that really makes it seem as if it's more prevalent now. Any other questions? I, Cindy Hottinger still has her hand up. Oh, sorry. Okay, no question. Okay. Uh, Chiquita just sent you one. I don't know. Can you read that? How often does ADHD get confused with other diagnoses or combined with another? Um, that's a good question. Um, I'm not exactly sure. Um, specifically how to answer, but what's going to be really important is gathering information from all people involved with the child. So not just getting information from the kid, but getting information from the parent, from the teacher, from other caregivers, even from other instructors, say dance instructors, football coaches, things like that, so we can get a good comprehensive view of what the child is like in several different settings and in different settings that have different levels of structure, organization, things like that. Um, now, again, what we use to diagnose um, the clinical interview, the criteria for, from the DSM-4, um, also we can use the rating scales that we talked about. Um, if they meet those criteria, then we are likely to give them that diagnosis of ADHD. Um, if we see other symptoms um, of either moodiness or, you know, problems with ideation of pride or um, disinterest in they normally like, um, if we see, you know, then we'd be more likely to think possible depression, possible mood disorder happening. Um, if we're seeing more, you know, really breaking rules intentionally or really just not listening to any adult defined, being very oppositional, um, just really lying a lot, trying to get out of things, then we might, you know, be leaning more so towards ODD. And again, a lot of these symptoms specifically um, suggest other disorders outside of ADHD. So we really have to look closely at what symptoms um, are presenting um, to different people and in different settings to really diagnose other things. Carol, am I still on? Yes, you are. You oh. Go ahead. Um, I ask that because I hear a lot of people, a lot of parents, they apparently don't know the difference between ADD and ADHD. So often I wonder if they are diagnosing their children or if the doctor has given a diagnosis for their child. Um, and often you hear, uh, like my son has multiple diagnoses, and oftentimes people do receive multiple diagnoses with their primary diagnosis or they have symptoms of something that goes with their diagnosis, their primary diagnosis and so forth. And you always seem to hear ADD or ADHD with something that they have with their primary diagnosis. And after my son's third diagnosis, which ADHD was his third diagnosis, I was like, okay, enough with this. So I was wondering, you know, it seems like ADHD is always linked in with something, either ADHD or ADD is linked with something. So that's why I asked that because it just seems to be, in the beginning it seemed like that had to be, I knew it, had, it didn't have to be, but it just appeared to be that that had to be thrown around everywhere. They had to make sure that ADD or ADHD was linked in with something. I mean, I don't hear it as much now as I did before, but you still hear it all the time. And the medications often were clashing, and parents were, like, freaking out every time they heard Ritalin because everybody's child was being put on some form of Ritalin um, just to regulate the child in school. So now, I mean, thank God for um advocates to try to get some of this stuff under control, but we hear ADD, ADHD, and Ritalin all day long. And you know what, I, we really do hear your concern as well as your frustration with this whole system and diagnosis, like it sounds like being thrown around in your experience. And we see that a lot, but the thing to remember um, as you were talking about the three diagnoses for um, your child and how many people you know have multiple diagnoses, um, the thing to remember is that ADHD is not a, a mutually exclusive 
this kind of diagnosis. If a child has ADHD, it doesn't mean that he's only going to have ADHD. He may have another diagnosis, may have later in life, may have um, bipolar disorder later in life, maybe have anxiety. Um, but it also doesn't mean that if he has ADHD, it's purely ADHD too. That may also be the case. Mm -hmm. um, so it really depends on the information gathered by the clinician when they've interviewed the child, when they've interviewed the parents, as well as other caregivers, um, other people in the child's life who've observed the child. Um, so yeah, I, I can see that ADHD, the, the diagnosis has been pretty prevalent, but then we also see that as a, as a mental illness has become pretty prevalent. Right, that's true. I mean, my, it was a true diagnosis for him. I mean, you can watch my son as he goes through each of his diagnoses. I mean, you say, okay, there's the bipolar act. Okay, here it comes with the Asperger's. I mean, you can watch it as it comes back and forth. But, you know, a lot of parents, um, they they just, when their child is acting up, they say, oh, my son has ADD. But they don't even know what they're talking about. You know, they really just don't know. And that's why psychoeducation is so important, and that's why, you know, we really commend you as well as the other people that um, called in for logging in and really trying to become, you know, better educated about ADHD, you know, and how it's treated and how the prognosis can be. So, you know, you're definitely doing the right thing. We're just hoping to reach as many people as we can to educate as well as we can about the disease, about other um, co-occurring diseases or other diagnoses as well, and just how best to, you know, treat such that, we have the best outcome for, for the children. Yeah, I do. I do. Um, when I go out and I speak and I communicate with them, I ask them to keep logs um, of what's going on and keep journals because that is how my son started getting his treatments because people, a lot of things that was going on with him in the early years, no one really thought it was possible. He, he's kind of like a unique case on a lot of things. But I started keeping journals and logs because they started looking at me thinking I was crazy, really. And then when they started seeing these patterns, they were really shocked at what was going on and what was happening with him. And that was the best way for him to get treated. And then that was the best way for them to kind of regulate his medications and figure out what to do with him because he was a very complicated case. But... um no one was really understanding what was happening to him at such a young age. I do want to remind our participants that this is recorded and it will be on several websites, so we may want to not be so specific in our discussions. Any other questions? You guys have asked a lot of really good questions. No? Okay. Did you get any chat questions on your side? I think Doctors? I think we've addressed all the ones that we've seen. In okay. I didn't get any. The only thing I wanted to know um, if this PowerPoint presentation would be available. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So um, either Brian or Mackenzie can send it to me and I will send it out. Is that okay? That sounds great. Okay. So I want to thank you both very much. This was uh, very informative, and um, I'm sorry. I do apologize for the technical problems, uh, but I think most people who wanted to get on did get on and were able to see it. If you were not able to see the slides, I will be sending this out both um, as a as a um, as a I guess a video a streaming uh, video you'll be able to see, and as well as the um, PowerPoint presentation for slides. Um, our next uh, webinar actually is next Tuesday uh, because November is National Adoption Month, and we are uh, recognizing adoption as a positive and powerful force in countless American lives. Uh, so next Tuesday at noon, uh, November 15th, uh, Adoptive Parenting, meeting the challenges with wisdom and grace. So thank you, everybody. Have a great weekend, and I uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you.
Bye-bye. Bye.